Hi everyone. Welcome to the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. We're here at NASA at this great facility that's used to train astronauts to make repairs to the space station. In the pool, NASA has a replica of the complete space station and astronauts put on scuba gear and descend into this 40 foot deep pool to learn how to make repairs to the space station. It gives them the feeling of that lack of gravity that's so important to experience before you get up there in space in a life and death situation. So when we think about creating training materials, this is a place where astronauts would practice what they learn in a classroom involved with making those repairs to the space station. This wouldn't be the first place that they would learn about repairs, but it would be a good place to practice and to hone those skills that they learned in the classroom. It makes me think of the different components of the instructional strategy that we as instructional designers are working to plan out and put together in this uh, part of the process. And it begins with pre-instructional activities where we're trying to grab the learner interest and really capture their attention and motivate them to be engaged in the learning process. And that's right. There's the ARCS model, um, attention, relevance, confidence, satisfaction. We have these tools as instructional designers that we can incorporate into the beginning of the uh, instructional strategy sequence of activities to um, really set the tone for what's going to come. And what you're talking about with the, uh, the pool reminds me of the practice that can happen in the instructional strategy. And so there is a time when we present new concepts. It might be a didactic. It could be in uh, a team-based learning kind of situation. It could be simulation. It could be role-playing. There's a lot of different ways that you can present information, and there's a lot of different ways that you can engage the learners to practice. Um, Lent, you use, you use role-play sometimes yeah, in your class. I do. Could you yes. tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. It's one of the strategies that I use in my class, one of the instruction strategies. Um, so the, the way that I use role-playing, uh, my, my purpose was for students to... Uh, like relearn or read, but my purpose is to reteach teach them. So um, I teach a lot of different uh, information in the class, but at the end of the class, when students are engaged with this role play activity, I usually do groups uh, and within the groups, they collaborate, they engage with the storyline, and uh, I require them to at least uh, mention something that they learned from the uh, session. Um, so, what kind of stories do they do? Well, the stories are about our current storyline within the course. So if, let's say, Captain Beltran is approaching planet Materia, you know, they have to mention about that. Oh. Uh, sometimes they meet with an alien, and then sometimes, <laughs> you know, uh, they found some sort of instruction material. And But everything needs to be tied to what they learned that day in the classroom. So that really makes them like memorize or learn or better remember what they learned from that session. So when they go home or two weeks later, they still remember that because there's a memory association with what they did in the role play. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, part of it. I just want them to learn the content uh, in a memorable way, uh, in a fun environment, uh, engage, and also collaborate within the group work. Yeah, that's very important. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, astronauts would have other activities like role play and like practice before they get to this pool. Mm -hmm. So they might have a, a provider, a teacher, uh, teach them about making these repairs to the space station. Mm -hmm. They might practice those repairs um, on an actual space station module. Mm -hmm. They might uh, have some kind of test to be sure that they knew how to do that, because when they're up in space, they forget how to do that, they don't do it, their lives might be at risk. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a life and death situation. Mm -hmm. Then after they really integrated that, like what you're talking about, then they bring them over here to the neutral buoyancy pool to practice on a real space station module. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So it's about bringing that learning context and performance context together to make the learning more authentic, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so another thing that you have to do at this stage in the process of instructional design is sequence the activities um, for the instructional module and plan out about how long it's going to take for each of those activities. So when you're doing more immersive sorts of strategies like simulation, role playing, etc., how do you estimate how long that's going to take mm -hmm. in your plan? Do you have any strategies for that? I mean, I usually go through like the list of the, the things that I need to complete uh, in order. I first put them in sequence, like in order. This is what I need to do first, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes. And after that, I do, let's say, a group work and I estimate that, let's say, 20 minutes. But it's based on experience. And also, I mentally go through the steps and then think about, you know, like an educated estimation of how long this would take. I need to know about my students and their level. Mm -hmm. uh, if this is completely new topic for them, it would take longer to complete certain activity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things that can help students when estimating uh, times for activities is to actually complete them themselves. Uh, you know, if it is a new tool, try it yourself to see how long it takes to complete, and then you can estimate uh, the correct number mm -hmm. for them. So that's one of the things I do. So I know you mentioned about instructional strategies. So at this point in instructional design, we have to be thinking about um, diff like you know, there's so many different instructional strategies that we can use for our units, instructional units. So think about those variety of instructional strategies. So we talked about simulation, role play. Uh, you can definitely do assessments like quizzes, um, you know, similar assessments. Gamification. Gamification. <laughs> yes. What, what we're trying to say is that uh, go out of your box and try to use different strategies that you don't normally use uh, with your modules. But idea here is that what's the best type of uh, strategy to reach your goal uh, within your instruction. So don't be afraid to use different type of strategies. Uh, the more varied, you know, students will like it more. You, you're going to reach out to more students and their learning characteristics. And sometimes you can go to new places to get inspiration for Absolutely. how to teach, like coming to the Buoyancy Lab and seeing the approach that they're taking here to immerse the learners in a simulated performance context. So this is how I think about it. I want to picture in my mind what that learner is doing at the end of the instruction, what skills they have. And then I think about what will help them get to that point the best. Mm -hmm. It might be role play. It might be collaborating in a team. It might be a choice of activities. So we might say to learners, demonstrate that you can do this and you can choose how you want to demonstrate that. I know you work a lot with universal design for learning, and that's a key component. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's about that flexibility in your design. So you can provide options for the ways that learners can engage, the ways that the material is represented to the learners, could be audio, could be visual, could be text-based, graphical, and then the ways that they are um, engaging in action and expression of what they're learning. So um, they can show, they can demonstrate, they can write about it, they can perform, um, they could do a closed response test. There are just so many different ways that you can determine whether or not they're reaching the objectives. And universal design for learning is this strategic approach to expand the options and say that there are multiple ways that people can um, experience the learning uh, materials. And speaking of materials, uh, I think that that goes hand in hand with the instructional strategy, and there are so many materials available mm -hmm. on a variety of topics. As an instructional designer, what's something that uh, you do when you are in a, in a project and uh, you, you need to get some inspiration or find out what materials are already out there? What do you do? I mean, I use social media. Mm -hmm. I, I, I go to Twitter and see what other people are doing. I mean, a lot of people, good people share what they do. And if I like uh, a strategy that they use, I try to Absolutely. implement in my class as much as I can. 
So yeah, just checking what others do. It's all part of this lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I like to do is ask Susie what she would do. I ask your ask your professional learning network, your <laughs> colleagues, yeah. your Absolutely. friends. And, yes, mm -hmm. and I get emails um, talking about what these people are doing. So it just becomes part of going outside my box mm -hmm. to try different things. Mm -hmm. But one thing I always do is I have a strategy up my sleeve, so that if things are not working out, I can switch, yeah. mm -hmm. or if I have some extra time. Mm -hmm. Or if I see that learners are not engaged, or mm -hmm. some of the learners aren't mm -hmm. engaged, I always have something I can fall back on. Mm -hmm. Like a backup plan. Like a backup plan, exactly. Mm -hmm. And there are some great repositories of materials in the different uh, content areas, PubMed being one for uh, health science education, uh, of course, you know, a, a professional learning network. There's a lot of hashtags of conversations that are happening in PLNs and organizations um, bringing uh, professionals together around different subject areas can be a great resource. Uh, message boards within those organizations following the hashtags. Websites, so like the Train Like an Astronaut has uh, materials available through NASA but that we could tap it. into yeah. and see how they might fit for our target learners. So we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel and start from scratch and writing everything um, from the ground up every single time. We can look at what other people have done and adapt and, start and expand and modify for our own uh, learning context and situation. One place I really like is Merlot. Mm. Not just the wine, but a repository of classroom mm -hmm. lesson plans, strategies for every content area. Mm -hmm. So I think it really is worth the time to look around and see what's already been done and what you can adapt to your learner's needs and your situation and your time. Mm -hmm. Like Susie said, you don't have to start from scratch. Build on what's already there mm -hmm. and make it your own. You could even tap into some of those experts that you did your analysis with at the beginning to find out what their recommendations mm -hmm. are, ideas that they have of resources and places to go for your materials. So I, I think that about covers all you're going to need to know. So <laughs> <laughs> get out there and work on your uh, developing your instructional module, and we'll see you next time. And we're going to show you some pictures of this great lab here at the end if you want to visit. It's a, a place that you can schedule. It really was a, an interesting experience, and NASA has a lot to offer, especially for educators. So long. Safe travels. <laughs>